Hey Rob, thank you for coming along again today. We're talking a little bit about the hurdles in which some emetophobia sufferers might have to hop over whilst they're overcoming their phobia. You know, for the most part, in my general opinion, is going through the program can be pretty smooth sailing. I see it every day in my practice and we see it with the data that you receive through the manuals, but for some, you know, me, for example, it can be a little bit more challenging. So I just want to dive into today why that could be the case and how to prevent that from happening. So I think it would be a good place to start going through this sort of chronologically. So what do you think could be the first hurdle that someone might meet whilst they are trying to go through the program? Okay, good question. Um, first of all, I think I think that everyone has the hurdles okay everyone has the hurdles if the hurdles weren't there they wouldn't have the phobia okay if there weren't some uh, resistance to change resistance to doing things differently resistance to seeing or feeling things or tolerating things there wouldn't be any hurdles so I think uh, so there wouldn't be any phobia so I think everybody has the hurdles they are just bigger for some than others okay so yeah. I, th I think I think the first one someone's going to meet really um is probably because of their sense of learned helplessness and sense of powerlessness is the fact that because they feel so helpless hopeless powerless in this area of their life remember most emetophobes are actually uh, powerful successful people yeah you know it's usually only around yeah. their emetophobia which is the only real issue in their life on, on on the whole okay so but in this area in relation to their emetophobia they usually feel pretty powerless pretty helpless pretty hopeless that's that's usually because they've had it a long time and that's usually because they've tried lots of things and it's because they've suffered for uh, uh, you know quite significantly usually for quite a long time you just get to the point where you think you know what can I do about it there's, there's, there's nothing I can do so when you then offer them a helping hand or, or, or you, you, know, you, you show them the Thrive program, you show them a, a metaphobia free, free program, free program. Even if we've got hundreds of video testimonials, even if we give them the first three chapters of the manual free, even if we explain to them how and why their phobia is caused and how and why they can get over it, because they've suffered so much, they're frightened to believe there's a cure. They don't want to get their hopes up. They don't want to build up excitement and hope that, that in a few weeks' time they're going to be over it because they don't want to then feel let down or, or even worse than they feel now. So because of that, they don't really, on the whole, have a lot of expectation of success. Mm. And because they don't have a, a high expectation of success, their motivation is less. Motivation is directly linked to how likely you think something is to happen, right? And then effort is linked to motivation. So the more you believe something's going to work, the more motivated you are to achieve it and the more effort you're going to put in. So even though this is the only predictable cure for metaphobia, because they... Uh, often won't allow themselves to get excited. Say, right, very, very few emetophobes get the manual or, or, or the coach in front and think, right, this is going to be it in six weeks, in eight weeks, I'm over this. I've never heard someone say that. Yep, yep. Okay, they don't believe it. There, there is a hope, there is a want, but actually they feel pretty helpless. Because of that, you could argue that the first hurdle is that they some struggle to put the right amount of effort in on a daily basis to it to achieve that success um and then again because of the the, the kind of helplessness or, or, or the more, more powerlessness really they worry a lot about a successful outcome they brood a lot they obsess a lot about a successful outcome they might catastrophize you know so it's almost like walking on eggshells for them when they're going through the program every day they're looking for signs that they're getting better 
but every day they're also looking for signs mm. that it's not going to work. And so even yep. though their their progress through the program, if you were going to look at it on a bar chart, is very much like that, going all the way from pretty poor to over it, their actual experience of going through it is more like a roller coaster that gradually goes up. So they can have you know, bad days or even bad weeks as they're going through the program. And of course, when they're on a downer or in a little bit of a blip, of course, because of their uh, binary black and white thinking, it's understandable that when you're feeling that way, you're thinking, oh, I knew this wasn't going to work. You know, I knew it's too good to be true. And, you know, all those testimonials are fakes and the whole thing's made up and I'm doomed and I'm going to spend the rest of my life like this. And that's a, that's a big thing to overcome. It is absolutely understandable why people feel like that. And you and I talked about this recently, and I've got to say this carefully. But recently I've talked to a, 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 a significant number of uh, sufferers and people that have overcome it. And I've talked about it in relation to how powerless they felt or they feel. And many have yep. stated, and this is not to in any way make a comparison between this and the other thing I'm going to talk about. But a lot of people have talked about it in the way that they imagine they would feel if they had cancer. And that's really mm -hmm. shocking. Okay, that's really shocking. Uh, I've not had cancer. I've had you know, a couple of bouts of brain surgery, as you know, but I've not ever had an ongoing, chronic, unpredictable illness like that. But to hear lots of people say, yep. I feel as powerless over my metaphobia as I think I would feel if I had cancer, you think, wow. So if that's true, which certainly is for some people, I'm not saying it is for all, but if it's, if it's true for some, you can understand mm. then why they put so much pressure on themselves going through any program to overcome it. It's the way you or I would feel if we were going to the doctors now for chemo. Imagine how we'd feel if we're doing that. I mean, every day you'd be thinking, you know, am I feeling better? Am I feeling worse? Look at my face. Am I, I'm looking pale. Why am I looking pale? So the hypervigilance mm. and the worry and the catastrophizing. Right. So now we, now we know that and we expect that. We assume that. The first thing to do then for how, how do we overcome that? The first thing to do at the very beginning of the program is to sit and watch a whole load of the testimonials, particularly the long ones, particularly where like Mary's going on for 45, 50 minutes about how she overcame her metaphobia after 75 years. Don't just hear the bit where I'm cured. That's that's easy for them to say. You know, it's it's all in the gray area about how hard they worked and how they yeah. persevered and this kind of so really, mm. really understand why the program's successful. Don't just start it in the in the blind hope it's going to help you want to from the very beginning understand why it's going to work how predictable it is you know there's that video of the journey from cambridge to london the pace video that's really good there's the fact you know these podcasts i think we've talked enough now about how it's really impossible not to overcome your metaphobia if you go through this program effectively do it well so really understanding why it's going to work should put you in a much more confident, comfortable, powerful position before you even start. Okay, so you're not just now blindly hoping, fingers crossed, hoping every day that something's going to get better. You can see why yeah. it's going to work, so you're a lot calmer the helplessness is a little bit less, or you put more effort in to keep it in check. So that's the first thing. The first thing is understanding why the program's going to work for you eventually, even if it takes you 10 weeks, 10 months, two years, okay? Doing the things that are contained within the program is always going to work. And a, a small, mm -hmm. a, a small a, a addendum to that regardless of whatever other pathology or hurdles or problems you may have, okay? So regardless whether you've also got ADHD or you've got some uh, gagging disorder or you've got globus hystericus or you've got, 
you know, other illnesses, problems, disabilities in your life that hinder your progress or are going to make it harder, which clearly some of those things will do. It's still, none of those things are going to stop the program from working because even yeah. if you have a plethora of, of other illnesses and ailments, they didn't cause your emetophobia. Your emetophobia is caused by your thinking styles, beliefs, attitudes, behaviours, etc., which we talk about in the programme. So regardless of anything else in your life, you will still be able to come, overcome your emetophobia with this programme. Sorry, waffling. So that's the first thing, OK? Understand, really understand. Don't just jump blindly into it. Understand why and how it's going to work, and you'll feel more powerful early on. You'll feel less helpless as you're going through it. Okay. Mm. The second thing, then, almost leading on from that, and as a real common symptom for sufferers of metaphobia anyway, this thing called perfectionism. So that's come up a lot in some of the testimonials, and I mentioned Mary just now, Mary being one of them. So the nature of perfectionism, and perfectionism, again, if you think about it, is really only the avoidance of having to tolerate anything other than being perfect, right? In the, in, in the sense yeah. of metaphobia or overcoming metaphobia, perfectionism is not wanting to fail, not wanting to only be 90% better, not wanting to tolerate any feelings at all. Therefore, I have to do it brilliantly and perfectly. And again, all that does is just put tremendous pressure on a person. And when, and when sufferers of metaphobia are under tremendous pressure, their desire for control kicks in, of course, and actually their thinking styles get worse. So if you go through the program trying to do it perfectly, in inverted commas, actually you're making it much harder on yourself. You don't need to do it perfectly. You just need to do it averagely well. Okay, but by trying to yep. be perfect yep. or get it absolutely right, sometimes people email us and say, look, just tell me exactly what I need to do every day. Well, just every day be putting some effort in to calm your thinking style mm. down, manage those beliefs, change some of those attitudes and behaviours, um, learn to tolerate some of those difficult situations you've been avoiding all your life. But essentially with perfectionism, it's just an A, knowing that it exists, knowing what the consequences of it are, and, and the negative consequences of thinking and acting like a perfectionist particularly going through the programme, the negative consequences by far outweigh the positive. You don't need to be a perfectionist to get through the programme. If you try to be a perfectionist going through it, you're going to make it, I don't know, 50, 60, 70% worse, harder, more hurdles. Yeah. Because you're yeah. creating the very stresses that partly created your metaphobia in the first place. Yeah. Um, so, Rob, sorry to just to butt in there. In comparison or in relation to what you were just talking about, a bit of a narrative that I see quite often is with the testimonials, quite often I could have a client that is massively comparing themselves to the glowy testimonial that someone can have, right? You know, there's a glowy testimonial that I'm on YouTube of speaking about how I've overcome my emetophobia, how amazing my life is now. And it is amazing now. And I have overcome my emetophobia now. But what you're not really getting from that testimonial is me talking about every single day, the ups and downs I had, the blips that I was in and out of. And, you know, my journey of getting to that point. So quite often I have a client that's sitting there and go, yeah, but I'm not like so-and-so off of that testimonial and they had it so easy. Why is it not this easy for me? You know? Yeah. How can, because there, there could be someone listening into this that is falling into that trap, that is comparing themselves to what they think being perfect and, and having the perfect outcome and going through the program perfectly looks like because they're comparing themselves to that said testimonial. Okay, so they're only comparing themselves to that said testimonial because they're looking, they are looking for reasons why they're going to fail. Okay? They're not looking for okay. reasons why yeah. they're going to be successful. I have never had an email, right, out of the thousands upon thousands that I've had, I have never had an email where someone said, oh, yeah, I saw XYZ testimonial and I understand why she was successful and I'm very similar to that so I can see it's going to work. I've never had that. 
Yeah. So if you're not a chance. if you're terrified of something failing, okay, if you're terrified of something failing or not working, um, you are going to look for the reasons that validate your fear. So, you know, as as I say a minute ago, you know, what what's the long testimonials where people are talking about all the hurdles they went through? Yeah. But we have, mm. you know, we sufferers have a, have a duty to themselves to recognise their thinking styles, kind of early on, and mitigate for them. Okay, so whenever they're watching any testimonial video, they should say to themselves, right, before I watch this, I've got to remember, I scored 90% on my obsessive thinking, 80% on hypervigilance, 75% on catastrophic thinking, black and white thinking, blah, blah, blah. Am I really taking the key message from this? Or am I zooming in on one thing that one person said? And that's very much what they're likely to do. They're going to zoom in on the one thing that one person said and go, well, that's me. Of course, I'm going to be that. I made the mistake, as you know, Joe, a few years ago in one of Lisa's testimonials. And it's 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 come back to bite me in the backside. I referred to her as the yeah. toughest client ever. I must have had, and mm. I, I, hand on heart, I have had at least a thousand emails from around the world challenging me on that, saying I would be your hardest client. I I would be much worse than Lisa. Yeah. It's like a badge. Mm-hmm. And I said to people, that's nothing to celebrate. It's it's not an achievement. Okay. But it just it just demonstrates the the sense of powerlessness uh, and the understandable, yeah. should I say, sense yeah. of powerlessness and the understandable uh, you know helplessness that 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 people experience. So if someone says that or, or, or says that to themselves or they pick out one thing on one testimonial, hang on, that's not because they were searching to find evidence why this is going to be successful for them. They're searching to validate their fear that it's not going to work. It's like the moment, yep. Coup's Law, the moment you're on the tightrope, the moment you think, oh, crikey, I'm shaking a bit, am I going to fall? You fall. Yeah, you're looking for mm. the thing that you fear. You're not looking for the thing that you want. You're not looking for for uh, um, reasons why this is going to be successful, reasons why it's going to be easy. There is one video, to, the only video testimony I've ever seen that we've got, and it's a, it's a lovely American lady, and I can't remember her name, but the first video is her in her car, and she did like a day-by-day or a week-by-week series of videos. And I think it might be Laura could be she, she said um and the first thing is the moment i got the manual and read the first bit i knew this was going to work okay yeah and she's had the easiest journey of anyone that i've ever known going through the program solely because her attitude from the beginning was she she for whatever reason you know I, I, and even now as i'm saying this i know some people can watch this and say and we were saying to themselves, well, hers was never as bad as mine. Of course, it was easy for her. Okay. Mm. But if it's yep. Laura, what she did, she, under, she understood the predictability of the program. Maybe she understood statistics better. Maybe she could, maybe she made more sense of the research. But for whatever reason, she looked at it and she went, yeah, this is going to work. And because she thought, yeah, this is going to work, she was much, much calmer and she just got herself over it. A bit like Mary did in in six weeks, and it was a foregone conclusion. Yep. Okay. So that's re- that's yep. really important to manage uh, um, how they're thinking about that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. No. No. That does. That's that's really helpful. Um, and just whilst we're talking about seeking out the validation of their belief that they can't overcome it, or they're too ingrained or too difficult. They're inevitably, as they're going through the program, can have a bit of a blip, right? Where yeah. they're going to stumble a bit, have a bit more of a difficult day than potentially they had yesterday, and likely see that as evidence that they're not going to get over this. That this is it. You know, you know, this is where I've made a nice bit of progress, but now, you know, that's it. There's no point. There's no point in me carrying on because I'm just a big failure, and this is too ingrained. This is too difficult. I'm done. Yeah, and then they stop putting an effort until they inevitably 
pull themselves out of it and get started again. But it'd be so much easier if they didn't turn that little stumble into a week-long stumble or a month-long stumble. So what do you think is the best way for someone that does have a little bit of a stumble, which is very normal and are very likely to do whilst going through the program, to approach that so that they don't drag out how long they are in that blip for? Okay, so one of the things in the newer version of the manual that I'm still writing, hopefully a month away, is I'm changing the placing of some of the things in the program, like the thinking styles I'm going to put earlier. As I just said a minute ago, people want to be aware of their thinking styles early on to stop them getting in the way. Well, actually, it's not until chapter five or something at the moment. So I'm going to put that earlier on. I'm also going to put really early on yep. something about blips. OK, because the, the, the best way and this is going to sound facetious, right? The best way to avoid staying in a long blip is to not go into the blip in the first place. It is to is to understand what a blip is and to understand the two main thinking styles that are, gonna, that are gonna put you in that blip. Okay. There's only two things that put you in a blip, okay? Perfectionism and black and white thinking. Okay? Mm -hmm. Those are the only things that put you into a blip. Black and white thinking puts you into it, perfectionism keeps you in it. Okay, you get into it and then yep. you beat yourself up. Oh, I'm such an idiot. Why didn't I do this? And that that self-loathing, that 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 self-contempt is what keeps you in that in that pit and you can't see a way out. And you're just furiously yep. creating stress and anxiety and self-loathing and self-blame and and depression and anger and all these emotions until you then come out of it again. And then it's plain sailing again. So avoiding the blip is keeping perspective or getting perspective whenever you feel yourself going downhill. Whenever you feel yourself starting to catastrophize, starting to panic, starting to think, oh, this isn't going to work because I felt, because there was a bug in school today and I immediately felt panicky. I thought I was getting better. Oh my God, this isn't working. At that point to immediately have something written down or recorded to yourself that gives you some perspective, you know. And one of the things I'm going to talk about in the new manual will, will be just do a little recording to yourself really early on. Uh, and if I feel myself now getting stressed or really anxious or going into that black and white thinking or entering into a blip or something, I play my recording and it says, hey, Rob, if you're listening to this, you probably feel like you're going into a blip. First thing to do is... Mm. And it might be, take a few deep breaths, take a step back. Remember, it might be saying, Rob, remember, you're a real perfectionist and you're you're likely to overreact if you have a bit of a bad day. So just calm yourself down. It's not the yeah. end of the world. You know, remember you're on a journey from Cambridge to London. And, and whatever, it, whatever the individual needs to pull themselves out of that blip or to stop themselves, you know, diving straight into it, that will be something they can do early on. And for people that are watching it, they're already going in the program. Do that today. However anyone ever gets out of a blip, and of course everyone gets out of a blip, they got out of it the same way. Everyone that's ever had a blip of any description that gets out of it, whether they're overcoming a metaphobia or, or something else entirely, the way they get out of a blip is always the same. They get some perspective. Yep. That's it. They get perspective. Yeah, okay. Stop some, giving themselves they get such some a hard perspective time. Perspective that it. stops them from thinking, I'm an idiot. I've cocked up. This is never going to work. I'm stuck at this forever. I knew it's too good to be true. I knew it wouldn't work. They have some perspective that pulls them out of that and they start to see the light at the end of the tunnel again and then they start to feel a bit better and the more better they feel the more positive they feel they start to think more positively and you know that they're they're their black marbles in the bowl slowly change to white marbles their mood lightens their lenses get clearer and things get easy because of it it's obviously much much better to prevent yourself from having a blip than to get out of one. And the way you do that is, is to recognise immediately or as soon as possible that you're heading down that road and do something like the dream technique maybe to immediately get out of that situation 
and 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 stop yourself and go and do something instead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Um, a, another way in which, from the way that I see it, that someone going through the program might, you know, stumble at a bit of a hurdle, get themselves into a bit of a blip potentially, is when they're trying to challenge their safety-seeking behaviours. So you know, you could have. Uh, a metaphobic sufferer that's wanting to try and reduce the amount of times they're washing their hands before they eat food, for example. Yep. Yeah, they, they want to tackle that. They want to reduce that. Now, of course, if we think about it, the only reason they're engaging in that safety-seeking behavior is because they believe that they are protecting themselves because they believe that being sick would be the worst thing in the world, right? So if that belief didn't exist, the belief that being sick would be the worst thing in the world, they wouldn't worry, right? They wouldn't, they wouldn't need to engage in that safety-seeking yes. behavior in the first place. So it is all about that belief. So I'm wondering, how much importance would you put on engaging in their safety-seeking behaviors to try and challenge themselves, to try and prove to themselves that they can do that, when actually it's just being driven by their main root limiting belief? Very, very little. Very, very little. So... I've okay. often said, and I think I've said on this podcast, I've often said that if people just worked through the first two or three chapters of the manual, all about the underlying beliefs, really, really well, really, really well, and got their scores genuinely up in the 80s and 90s, their metaphobia would just disappear. They wouldn't, they wouldn't need to read any, mm. they wouldn't need to work through any other chapters, right? So, yep. so I, I, think, I think if someone gets to the point where they where they they are pushing themselves to challenge their safety seeking behaviors they haven't they haven't worked on the earlier parts of the program enough yet okay so if i if i get a shotgun and i'm no longer frightened of being burgled i'm automatically going to stop checking the doors locked five times yeah mm. if i take a black belt in karate because I was getting bullied and I'm no longer getting bullied, I'm not going to be looking over my shoulder every five minutes, am I? If I overcome my phobia of spiders and I feel powerful in spiders, I'm not going to be trepidatious every time I open the cupboard door. That, that behaviour just mm. will no longer be there. Behaviour is driven by how powerless I feel to manage that situation. So I say to people, I, I, I really, you know, yes, we need to know how to do it, you, you you need to know very rarely, perhaps, and I'm guessing one in a hundred people will 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 create much more powerful beliefs around around their phobia, but still have their safety seeking behaviour either just out of pure habit or or because it's linked to some other yep. thought or belief they've got. And in that case, then yes, you obviously do want to challenge it. But in the same way, you want to challenge. Yep. All of your safety-seeking behaviors, right? Anything you're avoiding in life by hiding away from it, you want to challenge. We we only get stronger. We only we only build self-efficacy and feel powerful and resourceful by challenging things, the things we're frightened of. So, chat by challenging our social anxiety, by challenging how we talk to other people by challenging our fear of authority all of those things people want to be doing as they go through the program and actually i would say challenging fear of authority challenging their social anxiety are way more important than challenging their safety seeking behaviors and also are less likely to cause a lot of stress in doing so mm, yep. yeah so you need to know how to challenge uh, safety seeking behaviors you need to know how to uh, and practice how to talk yourself out of washing your hands five times when once will do okay you do need to do that um but actually if you get to the point where you th where you feel you're really needing to challenge them it's because there are still some beliefs back here driving it okay and it's much easier to work on the mm. beliefs you know t t telling someone uh, 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 to challenge their safety seeking papers when they still got the beliefs is like you telling me to keep my doors unlocked when we know there's a team of burglars working around my little cul-de-sac what i'm only going to feel anxious yeah. aren't i yeah I'm, it's only going to stress me out even mm. more let let me keep my doors locked joe 
while those burglars are around, let me keep the doors locked. Let me check the doors are locked five times a night, okay, while the burglars are here, until either I feel powerful about dealing with burglars or the burglars are gone. Yeah? Yep. So it's in the yep. manual. It's something you need to know how to do, but actually it's 5% of the program, if that. Okay, and, mm. and we touched on this before. The reason why, in things like uh, uh, CBT or other interventions, the reason why in CBT you might focus more on challenging those safety seeking behaviors, which is a very, very stressful thing to do, is because they don't work on the root of the problem. Mm. Okay, and if you don't work on the root of the problem, which is the fundamental underlying beliefs that are driving it. All you can do is try and challenge it. But that's horribly stressful. Yep. Horribly stressful and completely unnecessary. So when they are challenging the underlying problem, uh -huh. i.e. their belief that being sick would be a fate worse than death. Well, that's, right? that's one of them. Or seeing someone else being sick. Joe, that's, that's, yeah, that's yeah, one of yeah, them. One okay? of them. Yeah. Um, how should they be intellectually challenging that belief? Okay, so you challenge any any belief just by by looking for evidence, and you know I've I've, st I've really struggled to find a better word than challenging because challenging itself sounds a bit frightening and a bit stressful and a bit like hard work. Mm. You know, you, you know this for a, for yep. a while. Last year, for a while, I, I changed it to looking at those beliefs, but that seems just a bit too passive. Okay. But yeah. but what but what you're doing is, um, you you know if you've got a belief that being sick is the worst thing in the world, and you want to look at the evidence that might make you change your mind if you looked at all the evidence, okay, or 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 yeah. maybe not even make you change your mind but help you to realize that it can be overcome, help you to realize it, it's, it's not as difficult or not as bad as you believe it is. And this is really simple. It's a bit like ha having a phobia, like having a metaphobia is a bit like being in a cult in, in that you're not allowed to look for evidence outside your cult that might make you change the way you think about being in it. Okay, you're only allowed to. You're only allowed. You're not allowed to mix with people that aren't in your cult. Okay, you're only allowed to mix with people that are in it. And the, the sole reason for that, no matter how they dress it up, the sole reason for that is because if you realised your life could be easier and better than it is outside, you might leave. So metaphobes don't, don't yep. with any phobia. Okay, if you're if you're terrified of flying and you're in an aeroplane and you're feeling panicky. In that panic, in that moment, your desire for control, your guard dog is looking for reasons to validate why you think you're about to die in a plane crash. Okay? It's not looking yep. for reasons. You're not going, come on, Rob, what are you doing? Don't be silly. People don't die in plane crashes, you know. P planes don't planes don't crash out of turbulence, blah, blah. They're much safer now. Than you're not thinking those things. You're thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to die. And instead of asking yourself the question, how come how come the cabin staff aren't worried and how come they're still, you know, wandering around with a drinks trolley? Instead of thinking, that must mean it's not actually dangerous and it's a, a light level of turbulence and everything's okay. Instead of that, you think, oh my God, those people are idiots. Don't they know they're about to die? And, it, yep. and, it, and it's yep. that level, right? So... I forgot what the question was. What was the question? Well, no, yeah, no, it's, it's just making me think about, you know, if I believe that the earth is flat, right? Yes. Apologies if that is a, a belief of yours, right? As soon as I start to leave the forums that I'm a part of, I stop turning up to those flat earth conferences. I stop looking at all of this misinformation to suggest to me that the earth really is flat. You know, I start looking at satellite photos and I start watching videos and live streams of uh, satellites up in space from NASA. And I start really trying to suggest to myself that
that the earth actually is round, then very gradually I'm going to start to, you know, pull the wool from over my eyes and start to turn that belief on its head. But if I continue to go to those yes. conferences, to stay in those forums and to surround myself in that information that is telling me that the earth is flat, it's going to be really difficult for me to, to change my belief. Yeah, and if you go back to one of the earliest pages in all the manuals, the brick wall, where the bricks are the experiences yeah. or the beliefs and the cement is the reason why, if you only had a standalone belief, for whatever reason, that the earth is flat, okay, and nothing else connecting to that belief or propping it up, seeing a few shots of Google Earth uh, and and some and bit going yeah. on an airplane flight and seeing the curvature of the Earth would be enough. You'd go, my God, why was I thinking that? It's obvious now. And it would change as simply as a person's belief in Santa Claus changes when they get to eight, ten, twelve. Right? Little bit of evidence, and you yeah. go, of course. How could it be true? However, if you've also got the the, the, the paranoid thinking style, and the paranoid thinking style is propping up your belief that the earth is flat when you then see a google earth image you think google are in on it as well google are trying to convince it must me. be doctored yeah, yeah, not yeah. A chance. and you, you're going to start to to find reasons to back up and justify why you're not going to change your mind and that's that's a good metaphor mm. right it was good uh, simile because that is what emetophobes can do but very very simply if you start to gently look at the evidence that challenges your belief, very, very quickly, you'd, you'd come to an entirely different conclusion. And that, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we talk about the, the, the different types of phobias between the sexes, for example. You know, mo most phobias that people have are pretty much straight, uh, spread 50-50 between men and women. OK, you know, you're, you're yep. more or less uh, you, you are more or less as likely to have a phobia of death or darkness or lifts or snakes or spiders or dying or cancer as your sister. OK, a metaphobia, yep. though, for yep. some reason, is 95, 96 percent female, only 5 percent male. And that's really mm -hmm. interesting because if it was genuinely scary and genuinely frightening, like dying of cancer is or dying in airplane crashes, you'd be expected to find just as many men with that phobia as women. In fact, probably more because we're wusses when it comes to anything emotional, right, men? Yep. Don't, I don't want any sending me emails about that, right? You know, we're worse, right? We get the man flu. We don't get a cold. We get man flu. So actually, you'd expect it to be worse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not bad, oh, okay? But, oh, but very, very few men have it, okay? Also, if being sick was genuinely terrifying and and is a trigger which is a pejorative term and i never use it right it is a trigger for creating a metaphobia then after being sick you're more likely to create metaphobia which doesn't happen going through chemo mm. you'd be more likely yeah. to create metaphobia which doesn't happen having morning sickness when you're pregnant you'd be more likely to create meta which doesn't happen in fact all of those things are are, are more likely to get you over a meta and or inoculate you against ever having it those are the some of some of the little bits of evidence that would challenge your belief that this is the worst thing in the world and then you've got things like the fact that when people are sick even emetophobes they very rarely grade it as as higher than a two or three out of ten and most commonly they'd say do you know what rob it wasn't even that bad yeah all of those things if you if you allow yourself to think about them, would start to challenge your belief and reduce it a little bit, and and that's yep. how you go yep. about changing that particular belief. Yeah, yeah, and of course you've got to be a little bit proactive with it. Um, and that and ultimately, pretty much sorry, answers all of the hurdles. Sorry, Joe. Ultimately, yes, sorry, mate. the the one you the one you picked on, the the single most important part of challenging any phobia is the understanding that it's not something that is happening to you that's the most empowering yes. element okay the the moment you understand it's not happening to you and that it's something you are doing to yourself 
in response to something else, that is the most uh, uh, empowering part of it. People have phobias of pens, right? People have phobias of socks. People have phobias of tissue. People have phobias of little bits of wood, of paper, of the number 13, of, of, of trains uh, on a sidetrack in a station. You can have a phobia of anything, okay? But the moment I realise that this terrifying pen isn't causing my phobia, rather it's the way I'm reacting to the pen, I feel massively empowered and there's something I can do about it. Mm. Yeah? Um, yep. in, uh, in relation to some, you know, some, of, the, some of the other uh, uh, hurdles as, as, you go, as you go through the programme, uh, hurdles you might you might create going through the program it, it's often about just the the thinking styles kind of just getting in the way particularly if your desire for control is quite strong people often put in a whole load of effort over here and people might say but rob you know it's not that i'm not putting the work in. it's not that i'm putting the effort in you know i, I I'm, I'm putting in six hours a day effort and when you talk to them, you realise it's it's not helpful effort. They might be spending six hours mm. a day trying to convince themselves only to wash their hands four times. Well, of course, during that six hours, all they're doing is creating way more anxiety than they've had before. So it's not it's yeah. not a question of how much effort or time someone's putting into it. It's how much of the right effort they're putting into it. You know, l literally an hour a day is enough. Of the right effort yeah, yeah. and yeah. as you're putting in the effort you should be feeling a little bit more positive a little bit happier a little bit more confident a little bit more um hopeful and excited about the positive changes that are coming you shouldn't be worse if the effort you're putting in isn't having any even very very small benefit it's not the right effort so just go back yep. to the previous chapter and look at it again. Or look at what beliefs I've got that are driving this anxiety. There's no point in going to chapter two until you've really got chapter one. Don't go to chapter three until you've really got and understood and embedded chapter two. Yep. Yeah, there's, there's no point in focusing on, um, at the moment particularly, there's no point in focusing on thinking styles and hoping to overcome your metaphobia just by working on the thinking styles alone. It's not going to happen. It's all about the beliefs. It's all about that 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 um, fundamental underlying beliefs, not just the one belief that it's the worst thing in the world, all the other hundreds of beliefs that support that and your general kind of locus of control and your general sense of power and generally how well you cope tolerating uncomfortable emotions if there's one thing you could say it's the only thing right you know we've talked before about how someone causes a phobia what is a phobia a phobia is someone avoiding a situation where they don't believe they could tolerate the uncomfortable feelings so anything you can do yep. to help you tolerate uncomfortable feelings more is going to help but if you stay, you know, the, the people that are going to have the most hurdles are likely to be the people that are already avoiding facing up to confronting lots of different situations in their lives. Right? If, if, someone's, if someone's basically not leaving their home and they're not working and they're spending most of the day at home by themselves and they're totally avoiding any experience in life those are the people that are, are, are gonna create the most hurdles as they're going through it because they've got more things to overcome and challenge life is easy or, or much easier living at home not leaving your house not talking to anyone not being challenged not working not driving not cooking you know if you're not doing anything then you're then you're not feeling powerful you only feel powerful when you're pushing yourself, when you're challenging yourself, when you're overcoming things in life. If you're not overcoming anything, then basically you're probably avoiding everything 
then that person's going to have a lot more work to do going through the program because they're going to create a lot more hurdles because there's a lot more things for them to challenge. Yeah, yeah. Emetophobic sufferers love lockdown, but unfortunately mm. it's not actually mm. helping them to progress Absolutely. over their no, phobia no, anymore. No, not, not, not at all. Uh, and the other thing is just if their desire for control kicks in because they're feeling stress or they're creating more stress, then they're likely to be even more controlling of themselves or their or, or their food intake or their environment. And that, again, just makes it harder. And this is why, Joe, this is why the program has always been not overcome your emetophobia. It's always been overcome your emetophobia whilst learning to thrive. Cure your emetophobia and thrive, okay? You can't do it in isolation, okay? You cannot separate mm. the phobia from your normal cognition okay you don't think that way yeah. because you have a metaphobia you have a metaphobia because you think that way your thinking yes and your thinking styles and your beliefs have created this phobia therefore if you only focus on the phobia and not every area of your life not trying to thrive in every area of your life you're going to find it much harder to overcome your metaphobia, because your metaphobia is a symptom of your everyday thinking, beliefs, attitudes, behaviours. Yeah, I didn't really want to create a separate manual for emetophobia. You remember initially, uh, we didn't know each other then, initially we, we used the normal Thrive Programme manual, which was as successful as the specific emetophobia manual. The only reason I created one specifically for emetophobia is because certain emetophobes with a really, really strong desire for control would not go through the program properly. They'd try and skip straight to the end. And so I rewrote yep. the manual yep. to make it harder for them to do that. Okay, But they've got to focus on thriving. Don't be focused as you're going through the program on just, I'm, just, I'm only doing this to overcome my emetophobia. You're going to struggle if you do that because you're going to miss out on a lot of the beliefs and thinking styles that, that are uh, propagating it and making it worse. You've got to view, I'm going through this program in order to feel more powerful and be more in control of my life and ultimately to learn to really thrive and, and love every day of my life. As I'm going through that process, I'm also going to end up changing the thoughts, beliefs, thinking styles that created that phobia and any other mental health issue along the way that's that's what you want to be thinking i'm learning to thrive not i'm trying to overcome my emetophobia that's it yep cool okay fantastic all happy that you've covered all areas of hurdles i am that that pretty much skates yeah. over everything that i see in my general day-to-day -day. yeah being calm good understanding why it's going to work and every day managing your thinking managing your emotions to stay as calm and as focused and as positive as you can as you're going through it as you're going through the program the moment you create stress anxiety or fear or anything else it's just three or four times harder that's all and you don't want it to be hard mm. you want you, you really want it to be as easy as possible so taking responsibility for your emotions and your thinking styles as you're going through the program is essential i'm gonna stop waffling now I'm done i'm spent i'm tired fantastic no that's that's <laughs> really helpful uh, i hope you've all enjoyed uh, this chat today and it's been beneficial cheers rob uh, can we ask people joe to send in a, a request for you what may. they'd like us to talk about on the podcast yeah it's a really really good really good point you know what when i get this up i will add in a bit of a question form so that people can add in some topics that they want covered and then i'm sure that we can address that as well Fab. thanks very much good to see you